Where's the uh, puppy? Here's puppy. You got me. Hey everybody and thank you for watching another video. My name is Merge and welcome to the Breaking Bad What If series that I'm dubbing as the Heisenverse. A series where I make a change somewhere in the Breaking Bad timeline that changes everything that we know about the universe. And this video will be the conclusion of a storyline that I started regarding the recovery of Hector Salamanca and how him not being confined to a wheelchair changes everything. And if you could leave a like on this video to support the channel, I'd appreciate it. Now just to do a quick recap because there was maybe a month between part one and part two. And if you haven't seen part one yet, click right here in the top right hand corner so you can be all caught up. But like I said, this would be a quick recap. So in part one Hector was able to recover from his stroke being a background player calling the shots from the shadows and one day he receives a visit from his favorite nephew Tuco along with two random white guys Jesse Pinkman and Walter White and while they were conversing about cooking in Mexico Jesse was shot and killed by Tuco because Hector nor Tuco didn't like him and when Tuco went to dispose of Jesse's body Hank shows up. Now let's get into it. Hank and Tuco hold eye contact as he believes that he's looking at Jesse Pinkman. But when Hank sees the blood on Tuco's face and a lifeless Jesse on the ground, and not to mention the M16 that he had strapped to his body, Hank would take cover yelling at Tuco saying, Police! Drop your weapons! And then, the shooting starts. Heavy gunfire is exchanged between the two and Hank is able to get a hit on Tuco, causing him to drop the M16 and seemingly putting it into the firefight. But as Hank approaches Tuco, who's slowly bleeding out on the ground, he's able to pull the gun out that he had in the back of his waistline and get a point blank headshot on Hank, killing him instantly. And as Hank's body falls, Walter and Hector see the aftermath of the shootout and they both stand in shock for completely different reasons. Hector is deeply concerned for Tuco, seeing a gunshot wound to his abdomen, forcing Walter to help him up into the house. And Walter holds back his emotions of seeing his brother-in-law shot dead less than 10 feet away from him. And the only thought that keeps echoing inside Walter's head is what is Hank even doing here? As him and Hector help Tuco inside the house and sits him on the couch. Tuco then grabs Walter by the shirt, pulling him close and saying, I told you Heisenberg. Your boy was a rat. Tuco says between breaths and Walter responds nervously and fearfully saying, I swear I didn't know, as Tuco lets go of Walter's shirt. And then Hector asks, are you okay Tuco? Yeah Theo, it's just a flesh wound. I'll be okay. Just, just give me my stuff. Tuco says gesturing to the bag of meth that's on the table. And when Walter goes to grab the meth, the sound of a horn can be heard putting the entire room on edge. But Hector can see through the window from where he's standing that it's his two nephews, Lionel and Marco Salamanca. And as the two brothers exit their vehicle, they pull their guns out in unison seeing the bodies of Hank and Jesse on the ground. But Hector steps outside meeting them at the doorstep to explain what happened. And as they enter the house, they see Walter doing his best to bandage the wound and stop the bleeding. And when Walter finishes, he tells him, Okay, so it looks like the bullet went straight through from what I can tell. I mean, I'm no doctor, but I think you should be okay until we can get you to one. And Tuco sits up in the chair and says, Thanks, Heisenberg, as he takes another bump of meth from his knife. All right, all right. So, you ready to go? He says, looking at his cousins, giving them a head nod. And before Walter could respond, Tuco says in Spanish, Did you bring any gas? Giving a twisted laugh as his grill glistens in the sunlight. An hour passes and Tuco, Walter, Hector, and the twins begin their road trip to Mexico in a pickup truck. With Walter riding in the truck bed as he watches Hank and Jesse's car burn with their bodies inside. And to ensure that they can never be identified, they poured gasoline in their mouths before starting the fire, burning their teeth and bones. And now, finally alone, Walter can at least attempt to understand and process what's going on. Because not only is he now basically property of the cartel, but he is completely alone. And the only chance of him being saved at all burned up in Hank's car. And not to mention his family, as he says to himself. I'm, I'm so sorry Skyler as he watches the black smoke from the fire cloud the sky the next morning comes and Marie has been on the phone trying to get a hold of Hank and now is on the phone with Steve Gomez and she says it's just not like Hank not to come home last night especially without calling me and now I can't even get a hold of him okay Marie well I'm off today so I'll follow up on some of the leads that he was chasing and don't worry we'll find him Steve Gomez says before hanging up Marie then heads over to Skyler's place to help put up flyers for a still missing Walter and when she gets there Skyler opens up to Marie saying I just don't know how much longer I can keep doing this Marie puts her hand on Skyler's back before saying Skyler I told you I can take Flynn to put the flyers up you don't have to do everything on your own. I'm not talking about flyers, Marie. I'm talking about holding out hope. Skyler says to Marie with watery eyes, I just get the feeling that something terrible happened and I just, I just don't know what I'll do without Walt. And Marie goes in to hug and confront her sister. It's gonna be okay. You can't think like that, Sky. I'm sure any minute now we'll get a knock at the door or a phone call saying that Walter was found. Just you wait. And at that same time, Marie's phone rings and when she goes to answer the phone, Skyler watches as Marie's optimism is replaced with sadness as she's given the worst news that she can even imagine, causing her to drop the phone and fall to her knees crying but unable to make a sound and Skyler picks up the phone saying hello Mar Marie are, are you okay Steve Gomez says on the phone this is Skyler what happened Steve Skyler I 
I don't know how to say this, but we tracked Hank's car down through Lojack and it was found burned with a body in it. And at this point, we can't be sure that it's Hank, but the location it was found in points to the cartel's doing. I'm, I'm sorry, Skylar. Just tell Marie that I'll call her when we know more. And when the call ends, it's now Skylar comforting Marie. And even though Skylar's being the strong one right now, on the inside, she is just as broken up as Marie and she loses all hope that Walter would ever be found. A few months pass, and since then there have been funerals for both Walter and Hank, and although it's not been confirmed that the two bodies belong to them because they were burned beyond comprehension, they did find Walter's fingerprints in the house. And the story that's going around is that Walter owed Jesse Pinkman money for drugs and when he couldn't pay he was kidnapped, and when Hank showed up he killed them both and fled to Mexico with the Salamancas. But hey, that's just a theory. And the story only gets more twisted when Skyler finds Walter's money and gun inside the diaper box, and Skyler thinks about all the overdue bills that she has piled up and she would take and use the money and not tell anyone about it. And with a gun, I think she would throw it into the crawl space under the house just in case she needs to use it. And she don't have to worry about anyone going down there, especially since we've got rot. And for the time being, the money did help, but Walter and Hank's absence is noticed in the family. So to fill that void, Marie copes by doing her klepto thing at open house events, stealing spoons, and Skylar would begin working for Ted Binicky, and the two start an actual relationship, and everything is going great for a while. But when his embezzlement catches up with him, he'd be arrested and sent to prison, leaving Skylar alone once again. Back in Mexico, within just two days after they arrived, Tuco would die in his sleep from what seemed like a flu, and even when he was examined by the doctors, they couldn't figure out what happened. But Walter knows, and that night he was able to sleep well knowing that he was able to avenge the lives of both Jesse and Hank. But after spending a few months in Mexico at the Salamanca's meth cook, Walter is still having a hard time adjusting to his new way of life. And although he's not treated like a prisoner, I mean he eats well and he still gets his cancer treatment as promised by Hector, and he can basically get anything he wants. But the only downside is, he just can't leave. So in many ways, his confinement is sort of like a mix between Lalo and Nacho and Jesse and Jack. And one day while Walter's finishing a batch, Hector approaches him and says, tomorrow we're gonna have some visitors and they want you to teach them how to cook so they can learn from the best. Hector says smiling as he puts a hand on Walter's shoulder and Walter responds saying, okay, no problem, but who, who are these visitors? One is a chemist like you and the rest are, let's say business associates, nothing to worry about. And with that, Hector leaves Walter to prepare his lab for his visitors tomorrow. Because just to fill in some history, since Walter started cooking for the Salamancas, they have been the top earners for the cartel. And even though Gus has Gale and the distribution, they still can't compete with Walter's product, making the chicken man second behind Hector in the eyes of Don Eladio. But in the attempt to keep the peace, Juan Bos would force Hector to have his cook teach Gus and his chemist how to cook the legendary blue sky meth. And it's ironic because when Gus first sat down with Don Eladio, that was his idea. The next day passes and Walter is introduced to his visitors. This is my chemist, the best in the world, Heisenberg. Hector says speaking for Walter as he shakes the hand of Gustavo Fring. It is a pleasure to finally meet you. My colleague tells me that you're brilliant and we can't wait to see what you have to show us. Gus says with a casual smile and Walter says, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it, but it's all basic chemistry, returning the casual smile back to Gus. And Gail chimes in saying, a humble man, I see. Well, I tip my proverbial hat to you, sir. Extending his hand to Walter, then continuing to say, Gail Bedecker, and it is an honor to meet you, sir. And as he shakes hands with Gail, Walter smiles and then responds saying, it's nice to meet you too. Shall we? Walter says gesturing to the lab and Gail says, after you get sir. And while Walter is showing Gail around the lab to familiarize him with the equipment, he also tries to find a way to subtly hint to Gail for help. And thinking on his feet, he places a periodic table near a desk and jokingly says, it all starts with this. And Gail responds nearly laughing, don't even get me started. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium. And Walter begins talking about his process saying, okay, so a few key things to keep in mind during the cook to ensure the best product is when it comes to cooling, I use a helium based cooling system. He says pointing to the element on the table, and when it comes to lithium, I only use half. And again, he drags his finger over the lithium element on the table. And stick with me now, red phosphorus. Walter says smiling and tracing the word help from the elements with a slight panic in his eyes. And when Gail looks from the periodic table then up at Walter, his eyes grow big reading the message. And before Gail responds, Walter says as a cartel member passes by, and as far as changing goes, there's facilities right in the next room. And as Gail walks towards the changing room, he looks back at Walter before he enters, making Walter kind of nervous, but at this point, he's kind of gone too far to go back. And while Walter waits on Gail, he writes a note basically detailing who he is. And as he finishes, he's startled by Hector who says, I see you two are getting along. Just don't teach him too well, okay? Hmm? And Walter responds nervously saying, it's just nice to talk chemistry, that's all. And Hector just stares him down before walking back to the other dons. And when Gail returns all suited up, for the next few hours, the two begin a cook that was filled with all sort of double meaning questions and comments that reignites Walter's hope for being found. Because these guys are the two smartest people in the room and the way they communicate is just on a different level. And by the end of the cook, Gail is aware of Walter's real name and that he's been in captivity for nearly a year. And Walter was able to convey all that information while still being able to produce a 99.1 purity level. And in a bragging tone, 
when he says to Gail, sorry, I'm usually at a 99.6, and Gail is just in awe as he starts applauding Walter. But Hector cuts the celebration short, saying, all right, all right, are you done? Stepping right up to Gail's face, and Gus speaks up calling for Gail. And before the two leave, Walter once again shakes their hands, and when he goes to shake Gail's hand, he slips a note that he written earlier into his palm, giving it to him, something that Gus takes notice of. And then, the three part ways, leaving Walter hoping, no praying, to see Gail again. While Gus and Gail are discussing what they learned during the cook, Gus would ask Gail, May I see the note that was given to you before we left? And for a split second, Gail considers lying before he pulls the note out of his pocket and gives it to Gus. And Gail tells Gus, I didn't mean to keep it from you, Mr. Fring. I just wanted to wait until we were far enough away. He pauses for a moment and gets no response from Gus. He just stares blankly at him, and then he continues. His name is Walter White, and he's been a prisoner for nearly a year, and he might be the most brilliant man that I have ever worked with. And Gus says nothing as he looks down at the now open letter and faces it towards Gail, which reads, My name is Walter White. Please help. Gus then exhales before saying, Perhaps we could find a way to not only free this Walter White, but also take care of his captors in the process. But I will need your help. Gail agrees, and together over the next month, they make a plan of requesting another training session from Hector on the same day as Don Eladio's birthday. And after the cook, they would gift him the bottle of the Zofiro Onyeho tequila, and the rest is history. Eladio and the cartel are dead, and Gus and Gail were able to free Walter. But the only thing that didn't go according to plan is that the day before everything went down, Hector went and stayed in Albuquerque to check on his territory, leaving Walter in the capable hands of Joaquin Salamanca. And before this news makes it to Hector, Gus was able to have some guys keep an eye on him just in case he decides to go on the run, because this was the day that the Salamancas lost everything. We pick up with Walter, Gus, and Gail discussing what's next for the newly freed chemists as they head back across the border. I understand that you've been missing for quite some time, Mr. White, and the last thing I want to do is keep you away from your family for another second. But I fear the news of you being found will draw the attention of those who are still with us for the time being. Gus explains to Walter, and he responds in a calm tone looking at both Gus and Gail. So... What happens now? Once we make it back into town, I'll set you up in a safe house for maybe three days max, and after that, you should be good to return to your family. And just like that, you're gonna let me go. No strings attached. Walter questions. I understand your apprehension, but I have no reason to keep you against your will. I could even have Gail stay with you for the time being if it makes you more comfortable. Walter agrees and Gus then asks, is there anything you need before we get into town? And Walter would ask, would it be possible to at least pass by my house? Gus smiles and says, yes, I believe that would be possible. And as they head into town, true to his word, Gus was able to pass by Walter's home, and he was even able to get a glimpse of Skyler and a newborn Holly that he's seeing for the first time. And as they pass by, Walter begins to break down, seeing that he missed so much, and Gus just reminds him, saying, don't worry, you will be with them soon. And for the next three days, Walter and Gail bond over their knowledge of chemistry. And while the two enjoy a cup of coffee, Walter would ask, so why did you come back for me? And Gail smiles before saying, well, besides from it being the morally right thing to do, Gail says jokingly, you're also brilliant, and you being where you were would have just been a waste, Gail says looking down into his cup. Well, if I haven't said it enough, I'll say it again. Thank you. And who knows, maybe one day we can work together again, Walter says holding his cup up to Gail. Now I'll toast to that. We pick up with Gus and Mike going over their plan for the Salamancas, or what's left of them. We track them down to the property they have in the desert, and they've been lying low there for the past two days. So how do you want to handle this? Because for the cousins, I can pick them off from a distance, leaving Hector for you. Or if you want, I can just take care of all three of them. Gus considers his options for a couple seconds, because getting rid of the Salamancas is the plan, but Gus takes his time to think beyond revenge, to think about legacy. And he stands up to make the decision to have Mike take care of them all, as he has a bigger plan at play. And before Mike leaves, he tells him, I'll let you know when it's done. The next morning rolls around and Mike is in position with a sniper rifle, and at first he sees the twins step out, followed by Hector, and one by one, starting with Theo Salamanca, they are all picked off. Kinda like this scene from Better Call Saul. No! <laughs> Mike then calls Gus while still looking through the scope and says, It's done. I'll bring you back a souvenir. Mike says referring to the Salamanca's necklace. Gus then hangs up and calls Walter from the safe house and says, Are you ready to go home? And Walter says, are they gone? I assure you, Mr. White, you will never have to worry about the Salamancas again. I have a man that's on his way to you right now that's going to have you work on your alibi. Take care of yourself, Mr. White. And maybe one day, our paths will cross again. And Walter says to Gus, maybe one day. And the two hang up. Mike would arrive shortly after, and for the next hour, Walter works on a story with Mike, and it's basically the truth for the most part, saying that he was kidnapped and in order to be useful to such dangerous individuals, he was forced to cook meth, and it was only until a rival gang attack that Walter was able to make his escape and get smuggled across the border and hitchhike back into town. And Mike tells him, you just keep repeating that story, and if they ask you for more, you just tell them, that's all you know. And with that, Mike drops Walter off at the police station to make his statement. And after nearly a year, Walter White was finally reunited with his family. And although his story has some holes in it, eventually everything checks out for Walter. And in the end, Jesse Pinkman's name was cleared, the cartel was dismantled, and Walter White was never charged with any crimes. You and I both know I would never see the inside of a jail cell. 
A couple weeks pass and Walter and his family are all out getting lunch at a Los Pollos Hermanos restaurant. And when Walter gets up to ask for a refill, he sees Gus, but this time is blending in in plain sight manager Gus, which kind of takes Walter off guard because he's not acknowledging who he is. And Gus would ask, is everything to your liking today, sir? And Walter responds, everything is perfect. Thank you. Gus would then give Walter back his cup and says, is there anything else I can do for you today, sir? Not at, not at this time, Walter says. Well, if there's nothing else, you enjoy the rest of your meal and welcome home. Gus says before walking away to wipe down tables. And Walter returns back to his family to finish his meal. And before they leave, Walter would tell them to go ahead while he goes to the restroom. But actually, he goes over to talk to Gus. And when he approaches, he just says, maybe there is something you can help me with. And they look at each other without saying a word, but they both understand what's happening here. We then cut over to Gus showing Walter the laundromat and then the lab underneath, only to be greeted by Gail at the bottom. And when the two reunite, Gail says to Walter, you want to cook? Starting the beginning of a long and fruitful partnership. Hey guys, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the conclusion of this story. And all things considered, I'd say this one had a pretty happy ending. Gus wasn't consumed by revenge and he was able to see his vision through and we get a Walter and Gail partnership. And even though Jesse and Hank were horribly murdered, in the end, there was still justice. But I think Nacho's father would disagree. What are you talking about? It's not justice. What you talk of is revenge. But now I want to hear from you guys. What did you think of this story in full? Do you think I did it justice? Whatever it is, comment down below and let me know and I'll do my best to respond. Until then, my name is Merge. Later.